morning. Happy Sunday. And that, that's right. It's a day when we get to be together. We get to praise the Lord through His Word. We get to grow a little. We get to fellowship with each other. Bounce prayers off of each other and support each other through God's Word. Not very many countries you're able to do that. We are blessed. We are truly blessed. And it's all because of God loving us so much that he gave it all up. He didn't have to step down from eternity. He didn't have to take off his robe of righteousness and be born a humble servant only to be killed. But he did. He gave up his deity for a brief time and now he carries the scars forever because of it. He'll be the only one in heaven who has scars. Our scars will be gone. Our wounds will be healed. It's all because of God's love for us through Jesus Christ, his son. And the more that we work on God's way, his will for our lives, the more we can help him to achieve what it is that he wants us to do. And so this is the second part of the message titled God's Way. God's Way Part 2, if you will. When I was discerning this message, God just poured out his love in the people in the Bible and his will for their lives and how sometimes it went the way they wanted and most of the time it didn't go the way they wanted but the outcome was the way God wanted it to be. We saw last week how Joseph in pure obedience was mistreated. He went through a lot of hardships but in the end God's will was done for Israel. Israel was saved. Those 70 people that came out of the lineage of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob were saved because of Joseph not wanting to play his own hand. He let God lead him. Today's message is about Moses and his journey with God and God's will. How does God's will come about in our lives? I believe it comes through prayer, discernment, and actively seeking his will for our lives. Seeking what it is he wants us to do, what he created us to do. David probably puts that as plainly and as excellently as possible in Psalm 139. That's going to be our first point this morning, Psalm 139. And we're just going to read chapters or verses 13 through 16. It's found on page 618 of your pew Bible, should you want to follow along. 618. Let's hear what the Lord says about us. For you created my inmost being. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful. I know that full well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was made in the secret place, when I was woven together in the depths of the earth. Your eyes saw my unformed body. All the days ordained for me were written in your book before one of them even came to be. God knew before the foundation of the world that we would all be sitting here right now. And he knew before the foundation of the world that he had a plan for us, a mission, if you will, in the name of Christ before the foundation of the world. And if we're obedient to his plan, like Joseph was, then all things will work together for the good. Like that domino puzzle, one piece of good will spread out 
to all the other pieces. But disobedience comes sometimes into the play of this picture. And it can lead to a pandemic of negative results. Sometimes it's only a mixture of 90% God's plan, 10% our way. But that can cause chaos in God's plan. And this happened in Moses' life as well. God's plan for Moses started way before Moses' birth. It started back in Adam and Eve in the garden where God said the seed of the woman will crush the seed of the serpent. God knew that he was going to raise up Jesus Christ through the nation of Israel, and Moses had a part to play in that way back in the Garden of Eden. It was all orchestrated and planned, and God wanted the plan for Moses to come to fruition. And so we saw that last week when Joseph had taken 70 people from the lineage of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and now they had gone, at the end of the message, they had been close to a couple million people in Egypt through God's working. They were so great, Scripture tells us, that Pharaoh feared that the nation would help an adversary overthrow his kingdom. So he ordered all the male Hebrew babies born to be put to death. He didn't want them getting too big in number. Moses was one of those Hebrew babies that was designed to be killed. But Moses' parents followed Jehovah, not Pharaoh. His parents are from the tribe of Levi. And they recognize that God had a plan for this baby. And so his mother makes a basket and puts him in it and lets Yahweh take it from there. They recognize that there was something special about Moses. The original King James says he was goodly. I I would always like to say he was godly, but the Hebrew word is goodly. I actually am able to pronounce that today, not like last time. It's called Shaw Bar. It's to be pleasing, fair, comely, bright, glisten, beautiful, fine, and proper. This is an indication that there's a plan in place, that there's something special going on here. And so instead of letting the midwives kill this baby boy Moses, Moses' mom decides that she's going to put him in a basket in the reeds and she's going to let God take it from there. And of course, none other than Pharaoh's daughter finds him and rescues him. Moses' sister just so happens to be there. And she goes to Pharaoh's daughter and says, Hey, do you, would you like to have one of the Hebrew mothers uh, rear this child for you? And Pharaoh's, Pharaoh's daughter agrees and says, That's a wonderful idea. Of course, and I'll even pay her to rear this boy. God's plan was not that Moses perish, that Moses perishes. His plan was for that Moses' mom actually gets to rear him, and then he goes into the royal kingdom, into the royal household. That's how God plays it. Pharaoh's daughter, we're told from Scripture, names him Moses because she drew him out of the water. Moses must mean out of the water in Hebrew. For 40 years, he's educated and trained in all things royal. But in his heart, he's still a Hebrew. He still recognizes Jehovah, the God of his fathers. He has not succumbed to the God of the Egyptians. 
I'm convinced that Moses had the wisdom to know that God was with him through those 40 years, that there was a plan in place, that God had been moving in his life all that time. And I think what happened was that Moses had had a time of self-strength. He said, okay, I know what I'm going to do. I'm going to go out and rescue my people. I'm going to go and set them free. We'll take up that account in Exodus 2. Exodus 2 on page 56. And uh, it might be a little bit before 56. Um, Exodus 2, verse 11 is where we'll start. Anyone know the page? 56? I did get it right? Okay, I just wrote it down wrong here. One day after Moses had grown up, grown up, he went out to where his people were and he watched them at their hard labor. He saw an Egyptian beating a Hebrew, one of his own people. Looking this way and that and seeing no one, he killed the Egyptian and hit him in the sand. The next day he went out and saw two Hebrews fighting. He asked the one in the wrong, why are you hitting your fellow Hebrew? The man said, who made you ruler and judge over us? Are you thinking of killing me as you killed the Egyptian? Then Moses was afraid and thought, what I did must have become known. When Pharaoh heard of this, he tried to kill Moses. But Moses fled from Pharaoh and went to live in Midian, where he sat down by a well. Doing it Moses' way didn't work out so well. He was going to take it into his own hands, but that was not God's will. So this is the start of God's next phase. The, the next phase of training, which would also take 40 years. God had trained Moses in reigning and ruling. Now he'll teach him how to humbly care for sheep and to become a shepherd. Have you ever noticed that the quietness that's found in peaceful settings, like one of the ones that uh, Moses was put into out in the wilderness, out in nature, some of the quiet times are the times when you can hear God the loudest? Well, I think that's what happened. God took Moses out of this loud, structured environment and put him into a place where he could grow into a more humble, more knowledgeable person in God's will. Serene times bring closeness to God. There's no distractions. There's more opportunities for us to listen to what it is that God is speaking to us. The time comes when Moses is ready to start to fulfill his mission. He's now 80 years old, 80 years old before God's ready to start him on what he planned him to do. That we can pick up in Exodus 3, 1. Now Moses was tending the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian. And he led the flock to the far side of the wilderness, and he came to Horeb, the mountain of God. There the angel of the Lord appeared to him in flames of fire from within a bush. Moses saw that though the bush was on fire, it did not burn up. So Moses thought, I will go over and see this strange sight, why the bush does not burn up. When the Lord saw that he had gone over to look, God called to him from within the bush, Moses, Moses. And Moses said, here I am. There's so much in here I am that we will have a message on that one day, I'm sure. 
that the Holy Spirit will put that on my heart. But those are the most pleasing words that the Lord God Almighty can ever hear from us. They mean, I'm here, I'm paying attention, I'm ready for what it is that you have for me. Here I am, Lord. What would you have me do? That's what Moses said, and that's what Moses meant. Do not come any closer, God said. Take off your sandals, for the place where you are standing is holy ground. Then he said, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob. At this, Moses hid his face because he was afraid to look at God. The Lord said, I have indeed seen the misery of my people in Egypt. I have heard them crying out because of their slave drivers, and I am concerned about their suffering. So I have come down to rescue them from the hand of the Egyptians and bring them up out of that land into a good and spacious land, a land flowing with milk and honey, the home of the Canaanites, Hittites, Amorites, Perizzites, Hivites, Jebusites, and all sorts of other parasites. And now the cry of the Israelites has reached me. And I have seen the way the Egyptians are oppressing them. So now go. I am sending you to Pharaoh to bring my people, the Israelites, out of Egypt. Hold on, wait a second. What? I just ran and hid from them for 40 years because he's going to kill me. I like it where I'm at right now. I'm in peace with you. I get to talk to you. I'm in harmony. I have a family. I have a great thing going on here. And then God says, I will be with you. And this will be the sign to you that it is I who have sent you. When you have brought the people out of Egypt, you will worship God on this mountain. God's saying, listen, I'm going to be there with you. You're not doing this on your own. You saw how that went when you did that on your own. I'm going to do it with you. And then when it's all over, you're going to bring them all back here, and you're going to worship me on this mountain. God says, this is the course of events, and this is what's going to happen. He did the same thing to Noah. Do this. Build this boat because this is what's going to happen. He tells us in Matthew, Romans, 2 Timothy, Isaiah, and so many other scriptures that there will come a time when people will be lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. That unho they'll be unholy, blasphemers, disobedient, lovers of themselves. They will exchange the truth of God for a lie, worship the creature, creator, creature rather than the creator. They will be lawless and it will be increasing. Evil will be called good and good will be called evil. And Jesus adds in a couple more signs. There will be famines, pestilence, and earthquakes in increasing frequency. And then this is going to happen that this is the end. It's going to be all over. God gives us that in his word. Just like he gave Moses, this is what you're going to do, and when it's all over, this is what's going to happen. I'm telling you that. I'm going to be with you through that whole thing so that you know and that you don't fear. He tells us the same thing. Recognize when these things happen, the end is near. I'm telling you this not to scare you, but to tell you that I'm going to be there with you. And it's going to be all right. You are not appointed to this wrath that I have written in the end of my book. So fear not. Go on my way. Do what I ask you to do. I am with you and I will never leave you nor forsake you. He's telling the same thing to Moses right here. You will bring my people out. 
and then you will come to worship me here on this mountain. It's a done deal. Moses is obedient to God's plan, and it goes just as he said it would go. Moses delivers the people out of captivity, and we all know about the ten plagues that God uses to help pry them loose. The tenth one is, of course, God using a Passover lamb to deliver his people from the death angel in Egypt. And then 1,500 years later, God uses his own Passover lamb, capital L, to deliver his children from the death angel on the whole planet. So now, not only are the Israelites free, but God also makes sure that they leave Egypt fully stocked. He says, just go and ask the people that you work for that enslaved you to give you gold, silver, linens, clothing, food, carts to carry it on, and they will give it to you. So they do. And sure enough, they're loaded up with everything they need plus more. They don't know why the gold and the silver and the linen, but God has a plan. Down the road, he's going to have a tabernacle constructed, and they're going to need all that stuff. God, of course, leads Moses by the way of the wilderness that ends right in front of the Red Sea. Pharaoh comes to his senses and says, Oh no, I want my slaves and stuff back. Scripture tells us that he sends out his whole army. The Israelites, of course, freak out. Have you brought us here to let us die at the hands of the Egyptians, they scream? But look at what Moses says in Exodus 14. Exodus 14. I'm thinking that I got the wrong card here. So someone's going to have to say where Exodus 14 is. It's your second book in um, Exodus 14 67 thank you and we'll start at verse 13 68 my apologies this is important Moses answered the people now they're freaking out right they see the Egyptians coming he says do not be afraid stand firm and you will see the deliverance the Lord will bring to you today. Moses does not panic. The Egyptians you see today, you will never see again. The Lord will fight for you. You need only to be still. It does not say anything about the Israelites leaving Egypt with... AK-47s and rocket launchers. No, they have nothing, and this army has everything. But Moses says, what? He says, you need only be still. Don't worry about this. You'll never see them again, and God's going to take care of this. And I think I know why. Because God can hardly work where there's bickering and moaning and fear and chaos. The Israelites have to be still and know that God knows what he's doing. Jesus was not able to complete a lot of miracles in his hometown just because there was no trust. There was a lot of clatter going on. Aren't you the carpenter's son? I saw you growing up. Jesus could not do a lot of miracles because there was doubt. Moses made it clear there's no room for doubt here. We have a God that's much, much greater than these puny Egyptians. You'll never see them again. God, of course, parts the waters of wa- the walls of water. Now, some of the deranged people in today's society are saying, well, it was probably just a shallow little crossing that they went across. 
The Red Sea at its deepest point at the Sukhothai Trough is 9,111 feet deep. So when scripture tells us that God parted the water and there was walls for the Egyptians or the Israelites to walk through, then you can bet your booty that they were probably a good three, four thousand feet high. And scripture tells us they walked through on dry ground. We're talking dusty, flat ground. Amen. There's no mud there. God carries them through on eagle's wings. Not only that, but he leads them in the pillar of cloud. And then when the Egyptians start to come closer, he moves to behind the Israelites to shield them from seeing the Egyptians come. They get through. The Egyptians do not. We know how that ends. But that doesn't last long. And this is the part that always knocks me for a loop. you just seen God part the Red Sea. You're walking through on eagle's wings. You see the Egyptian army getting compressed under billions of tons of water. And then one of the first things they say is, what shall we drink? Have you brought us here to die in the wilderness? So, of course, the Lord provides sweet water where there was bitter water. Next, they grumble, what shall we eat? In Egypt, we had meat. We had all that we could eat on stew and all sorts of different foods till we were full. So the Lord provides manna. But what about meat? This goes on and on and on. The Israelites are doing nothing but complaining after what they just saw happen. The Lord provides them quail. The children of Israel started to move towards the promised land spoken of at the beginning of this message. The land of milk and honey. Now, Scripture refers to it as the land of milk and honey because in order to have milk, you need cows. You can't have cows unless they can feed on grain or whatever cows feed on. I'm not a farmer. You can't have honey unless you have bees and you have flowers and you have fruit because bees make the honey. So this is a land all set to go. It's a turnkey operation. Scripture tells us, God says, just go on in there and I'm going to cast these people out from before you with hornets. You won't have to do anything, you're just going to walk on in. So they're starting to head towards that area and then once again they come up with a little three days, I believe it was, of no water on their journey. So. They once again say, All right, did you bring us out here to die of thirst? And God commands Moses to go up to the rock and to strike it. And water will come pouring out of the rock and it will be quenching for everybody. And on and on it goes. We're hot, we're cold. So God provides the pillar of cloud by day, the pillar of fire by night. Our shoes are wearing out, so God provides shoes that do not wear out. This goes on, by the way, all the way. Th uh, they complain through Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. The complaining never stops. Moses, however, obediently follows God's will. He builds the tabernacle as God commands he passes on God's Ten Commandments and all he gets in return is more ungrateful, rebellious attitudes from his followers. A leader cannot lead if the followers do not follow. I'm actually surprised that he doesn't pull a Jonah and say, I'm out of here. You know what? I tried, but these people that you gave me, they just try me to death. 
Lord, I know what you want me to do, and I'm trying, but these people, they don't see everything that you've done. All they do is complain. And I think I know why that is. Because within any kind of a big group, Satan always has his people. He always has the ones that are grumbling. He always has the ones that are complaining, that are spreading rumors, that are lying, that are just trying to make it all pitiful. That's how he works. Like a cancer. So that they spread through the population and before you know it, there's chaos and calamity and that's just what he wants. One of the typical examples of the Lord getting angry about these people complaining, we can read in Numbers 11. Numbers 11 is on page 140. Numbers 11. Now the people complained about their hardships in the hearing of the Lord. And when he heard them, his anger was aroused. Then fire from the Lord burned up among them and consumed some of the outskirts of the camp. When the people cried out to Moses, he prayed to the Lord, and the fire died down. So that place was called Taborah, because fire from the Lord had burned among them. And when there was not complaining, they got impatient. I need it now, the message on July 24th of this year tells us about how impatience can thwart God's plan. The I need it now mentality is never what God has proposed. God proposes be still and listen. Not your time, my time. Moses is up in the mountain and he's getting the Ten Commandments from God. But it's taken too long for the people down below. So they have Aaron make them a, a new God in the form of a golden calf. They said, well, this Moses that was our leader has been gone too long, so now we need a new God. God's furious. But Moses intercedes. Like Merritt said today, when we pray the word back to him, he listens. God says, I'm going to annihilate them. They have turned from me. They are worshiping golden calves. They are dancing naked. They are just an abomination to me. And Moses says, but God, Lord, you said that you were going to make a great nation out of them. You promised Abraham that the lineage would be so great that they would not be numbered. And now you're going to banish them? You're going to vaporize them? And God relented. Scripture tells us God relented. I'm not claiming that God changed his mind. I'm claiming that Moses brought up an argument that was God's own words. He claimed it. He said, Lord, these are your people. Moses wasn't perfect. None of us ever are. He was disobedient in a couple of different instances. The second time when the, or the third time when the Israelites wanted water, God had commanded Moses to go and speak to the rock. That was significant to God because the rock represented Jesus Christ where living waters flow from. And so Jesus Christ cannot be smitten twice. He cannot be hit twice. So God commanded Moses to speak to the rock. Moses struck the rock. And so he was not allowed to see the promised land that God had promised. God had taken that privilege away from him for disobeying his will. And there was a second time where Moses 
listened to his own instincts and to the people around him instead of listening to God, and that's at the cusp of the promised land. They're standing there. They've already seen what God has done in the past over and over and over and over again, making the impossible possible. And they're standing there saying, hey, listen, I don't know. I think we should send 10 spies in there. Let's find out what it's really like in there, or 12 spies. Let's try and find out what it's really like on the other sides of those trees if this really is a land of milk and honey that we can just go in and get it. And of course, 10 of them come back and say, oh, we're just gonna be like grasshoppers to them. They're just gonna annihilate us. They're gonna kill our children. Of course, Joshua and Caleb, they say, no, we can do this. God said we can do this. We can do this. God's way is that we walk on in and let him take it. For us. So, of course, that had repercussions as well. As Max would say, and he said when he was a little kid, he goes, Oh, Dad, so that means they must have got a 40 year time out. And I go, Yes, that's correct. They got a 40 year time out. And not only that, but all those doubters that said, No, we can't do this, they died in the wilderness, and so did their kids. The ones that they were afraid were going to be killed by the Canaanites and all the other parasites were killed in the wilderness because they didn't believe God. So those were two occasions where a little bit of disobedience caused a lot of suffering. I'm sure that Moses would have wished to have taken that back, those two things. But again, no one's perfect. Moses did God's will in many occasions, on many different time, at many different times. God entrusted him and loved him so much that he let him write the first five books of his word. That's a huge responsibility, especially Genesis. He wasn't that far removed. I think it was three generations if you look at the timelines of Adam through Moses. So he wasn't as far removed. Of course, they lived a lot longer in those years, in those uh, ages. But God lets him write the first five books of the Bible, some of the most precious learning points and and inspiration of who God is are found in those five books. So God has a use for everyone, not just the Moseses, not just the Abrahams, not just the Josephs. He has a purpose, a will for everyone. And to him, every single one of our paths is just as important as Moses's was. He gives us maybe a lot less responsibility for what he has planned for our lives, but he has a specific plan for each one of us that will work together in the realm, the big picture, the realm of all things. People are never perfect, but God always is. If we keep knocking and seeking, we will find If we keep discerning and doing, we will be successful. If we keep asking and listening, we'll know the way. Father, thank you for bringing to light that your way is the best way. That if we're not sure about your way, that we pray about it that we ask you to show us what your way is so that we don't do it under our own power. Prevent us from being blind to your way. Give us those moments in the wilderness where we can come closer to you so that we're not distracted by today's busy, busy lifestyle, by the noise that goes on around us 24 hours a day. 
by the media, by everything other than your word, it's useless. Remind us that you've told us how it's going to happen. You've shown us your way in your word. And we can bet our life on it because Jesus bet his life on it. And then if we just follow your way, it'll all be all right. So help us to see what it is that your way is for our life. In Jesus' name, we thank you for doing that. Amen.